Ladies and gentlemen, sports fans alike, welcome to another edition of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. One of the couple, two, three best podcasts around. So sit back, grab yourself a cold one and a pole of sausage, park your keister in the front room, and listen to Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose as long as the Packers lose. For everything you need to know, it's Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Bill. Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. This is your hosts, Alex and Sean. On this episode, we are going to be talking about a damn hell ass, another loss to the stupid Green Bay Packers. Uh, we're going to be talking um, hot stove starting to peak up a little bit. We're going to be talking bulls. We're going to be talking Blackhawks. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. If you're not familiar with the Rockford Ice Hogs, they're the AHL minor league affiliate of the Chicago Blackhawks. What does that mean for you? You get to see the stars of tomorrow today. At family-friendly, affordable prices. So make sure the season's going on. So make sure you head on over to icehawks.com, get a hat, shirt, jersey, tickets, and more. Tell them Swirsky Sports sent you. Alex, how are you doing today? I'm doing okay. I- I'm doing okay. You know, there was uh, a Bears game today against a notable opponent. And the outcome is pretty much what you've wanted to see for the most part in this season. You see your quarterback do things and you lose to help get that better draft pick that happened today. But considering who the opponent was, there's still that little feeling of damn it foiled yet again to the hands of the same person. I mean, it's, it's frustrating because the bears were winning that game, both on the scoreboard and just dominating things for a good chunk of the game. Mm -hmm. And then the wheels just sort of came off. Yeah. And you know what? I think if there was one thing that I was really upset about with today, I just, I hated the offensive play calling in the second half. I thought it was way too conservative. And I thought it would have been a much better idea to just let your QB sling because when he did throw You know, we can talk about the interceptions in a minute, but throughout most of the game, when he was throwing, he was slinging it. I mean, he was throwing darts out there. He was completing multiple deep passes. He was using his feet to kind of move around under pressure and was able to find Cole Komet on one of those plays. I'm I'm sure you know which play I'm talking about. But, you know, he was throwing well, but they spent so much of the second half, they'd get into the, you know, the red zone, or at least they'd get deep into Green Bay territory, and it was just conservative runs and failed screen pass after failed screen pass. It just, that really irked me. Let your QB sling it because that honestly cost you the game. Again, wins don't mean anything, but you could have won if you would have played a little more aggressive. I do believe that. And before we get too much in this game, I want to, I want to discuss something. And, um, you know, we've talked about it a little bit. And if you listen to, uh, the score. Um, there was a little bit of back and forth. Brad Biggs was on the morning show with Mully and Hall and kind of being dismissive of any Bears fans or media that were in favor of losing games. And he's like, you want to win games no matter what. And his point is, you win games, teaches you to win. Um, you know, it's it, it builds a better uh, morale with the team, um, et cetera, et cetera. But Harkins and Spiegel are uh, they're in the camp of you want that better draft pick. And I'm firmly entrenched in that same camp as well. Yeah, we don't enjoy losing. Yeah. When I watch a game, I didn't actively root for the Bears to lose. Because listen, when I watch a game, I'm in watch game fan mode. I was really hoping during the game today that meatball fan in me took over. I wanted to be Aaron Rodgers and the Packers. 
And I really wanted it bad. But as soon as it was over, you say, all right, this gives us better chances for a better draft pick again. We saw the good things from Justin Fields. Okay, this is better in the long run. I mean, the long run here is what we want to really follow at this point because wins on their own don't mean anything. And sure, it's easy to get wrapped up. I mean, listen, when the Bears lost the Lions, when the Bears lost the Dolphins, the first few minutes after those games, I, I was bummed. Today, I was bummed because I'm tired of seeing that I own you crap and, and all that stuff. And it's like, damn it, again. But then you say, all right, take a minute, step back, look at the big picture, because that's what matters. And when Brad Biggs mentions the whole winning culture thing, on a certain level, I get what he's trying to say. I just don't think that winning games makes or breaks the morale going forward, considering that your team is going to be very, very different next year. There's going to be a lot of new players. There's going to be a new mindset. And this is what happens in the NFL. NFL teams will go through bad seasons, and then they will immediately follow up with a good season. You go from worst to first all the time in the NFL. And we've said this before. We'll say it again. Look at how Peyton Manning started off his career. Look how Troy Aikman started his career. I don't think even John Elway got off to the greatest start. It just, well, you know. It, Brad Biggs, the big flaw in his logic was thinking that if the Bears somehow are winning games, that makes them closer to being a contender than if they lose them. Not necessarily. And I don't agree. It's all right. Let's say, let's say the calls were made properly in the Dolphins game. Mm -hmm. Nothing else changed. They just made the proper calls. The Bears probably win that game. Right. Um, there's a couple of games that were very close. The Vikings game, the Vikings Lions game. game. Yes, that you could have easily won those. And you are still the same exact team. You are no closer or further away from being a contender. But now you have a worse draft pick. How does that make you get better? You know, it's it's not like, oh, hey, if they pull some of these games out, that suddenly the players that are playing are, you know, they're going to be key pieces going forward. Um, the, the fact of the matter is this team was not put together to win. No, you know, none of the free agents that Ryan Pohl signed in this off season should be judged on his body of work because they were not meant to be free agents that are, he brought in to make this team a winner. I mean, they a lot were, of those free agents were just fillers. They, they were, were warm yeah. bodies. They're, you know, uh, it's not like, oh, hey, Byron Pringle was a big signing. He he was like a one year, $5 million. That is not a major signing. Uh, you know, Justin Jones was the biggest signing he had. And that's not a bank breaker either. And it's, and he's been the best defensive lineman they've had. It's just not, he hasn't been good enough. Um, to make this team a winner, but you know, the, if you're, if you lose these games and you wind up with a top two pick, I don't think they will wind up with a top two pick. And I'll talk about that in a second, but say they wind up with a top two pick. There are going to be desperate teams to wanting a quarterback that are going to trade up. And the Bears can take advantage. Mm -hmm. You know, if you wind up with two firsts, either two this year or one this year and one next year, that helps you because two first rounders are better than one first rounder. Um, and that's that's how you get it is you get more bites in the top 100 draft picks. More bites. And uh, that's how you're going to build a winner. And the other issue that is in play, and, and I talked about it a little bit last week, but I, I really want to reiterate this because a lot of people seem to be missing this point. <clears throat> when you look at when they talk about the current standings for the the draft order for the NFL draft, um, <clears throat> there are right now the Bears are have the second pick, but that's because the bears have had 
a buy so late that it skews it. The Bears have one extra game than most teams at this point. So because they've lost so many, the Bears are really the second pick because they have more losses. Um, when they have their bye week, Denver and the Rams can tie them in the record. And without playing a game, the Bears could end up jumping up into a worse draft position by not playing. Because yeah, other that's teams... true. So um, right now, I, I think Houston is almost all but locked up that number one pick. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I don't see anybody passing them up because I don't see Houston winning another game this year. They have what one win? One win. One yeah. win in a t- one and a half. They have a tie. Yeah, right, right. Um so I- I'm gonna for the purposes of just the mathematics of it, I'm gonna call a tie a half win. Um that's fair, yeah. So outside of Houston, there are two th- teams two through ten have either three between three and four and a half wins. That's a pretty tight window, right? Yeah, I'd say. And then teams two through 15 have between three and five wins. So when, so there's a lot of teams that are right there with the same terrible record. And the problem is when in the NFL, in the draft, the tiebreaker for if you if multiple teams have the the same record for the draft the tiebreaker is the team that has the easiest schedule the strength easiest strength of schedule gets the better pick and the team with the uh strongest the highest strength of schedule gets the worst draft pick now do you know what team in the NFL has the uh the the strongest strength of schedule in the entire NFL. The strongest. Yes. Uh, Toughest, toughest strength of schedule in all of the NFL. It's not us. Is it? It is us. It is us by a lot. Wow. Okay. Um, so if, if the bears had won today, Hmm they would have catapulted themselves into the 10th draft spot. That's significant. Mm -hmm. That is is very, very significant. um, So, you know, a winner, winner two along the way might make you feel better for a couple of days, but it really is huge in the standings. It's, you know, it's one thing if they had middle of the pack, uh, strength of schedule, you know, I go, okay, they might drop a pick or two here or there, depending on things. Um, but their strength of schedule is so much stronger than everyone else's. So the bears strength of schedule is five seventy three. The next closest one is uh green Bay is five sixty six. Um, Detroit five fifty three. Miami forfeited, so I don't really count. Cincinnati's 537. So really, the Bears are just, most teams have have around a 500 or less strength of schedule. The Bears are just, they had a tough schedule. And um, so that just makes it tougher for them if they were to win a game. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. You're absolutely right. I mean, I think that you mentioned that the other week, and it makes sense. Um, the man did the is the Rams game not over? The oh, Rams geez. lost, I believed, which they they were winning late, and then oh, I think yeah, they, they blew did. it. So yeah, I, refresh uh, I was pissed. I'm like, oh please, please Rams, please. Oh yeah, Rams. here we go. I just needed a refresh. Um, because the Rams lost and the Broncos lost this week. The Broncos lost 10 to 9. That Russell Wilson trade oh is God. so bad. 
Go on Spot Track and look at his contract and the guaranteed money, and you're oh. just gonna laugh your butt off. Oh, I know. It's there. Somebody did a like a a video about it, and it it's it was so outrageous that that I couldn't believe it. It's like, all right, so his new contract that they gave him, that giant contract extension, it hasn't even kicked in yet. He's got like another two years before it kicks in this season. I think next season, and then it kicks in. <laughs> so they're not even in the big money of it yet. Imagine so if we would have gotten that. Oh, I know that would have, we dodged such a bullet. We dodged a missile. Yeah. We, we dodged like, like an Armageddon level, like meteor hitting our planet. Like that's, that's how bad it is. I picture dodging a bullet bill from Super Mario. Oh man. We we could have had Russell Wilson and instead we got Justin Fields. Huge victory there. Yeah, no kidding. You know, it's the more you explain this, the more you really reiterate about strength of schedule and the pick and how close it, we all know how close it is, but you know, the more you explain it, the better I feel about losing today. Like, honestly, like this is honestly the perfect therapy. Okay. So Aaron Rodgers owned us again. You know what? He didn't even play that great today. In my opinion, no good, good it, for them. And they're what, was five that, and eight now. Yeah. They're, they're talking about shutting him down for the rest of the season. Right. Um, they're, they're not going to make the playoffs. So whoop de do Right. whoop de do I mean, you, you beat the bears. You're not going to make the playoffs. I mean, the bears kind of beat themselves today, I think, but yeah. Yeah. We'll, I, we'll talk about that more, but here's this, the reality. So I think is the bears by next week. Yes. Okay. Bears by is next week. Next week at this time, the bears without playing will probably drop from pick two to pick four <laughs> because the bears are th- three and 10. Denver's three and nine and the Rams are three and nine. And the Rams won't have Stafford for the rest of the year. I believe. Yeah. I mean, he's done. And the Broncos just, they're just the disaster. Don't, I mean, there's talk that they're going to fire uh, their head coach. Maybe that gives them a spark and they win a couple of games, which would be good. Oh, that would be glorious. That would be absolutely glorious. Something's got to change there immediately. Like this is a tire fire of all tire fires in Denver. Yeah. So assuming that Denver and the Rams lose next week, all three will wind the bears, Denver and the Rams will all be three and 10 and the bears, because they have the highest strength of schedule then goes from two to four. Why couldn't we have lost that Texans game? (laughs) <laughs> and Texans win didn't even feel good. I'm looking back at that now and wishing we would have lost that game. If we would have lost that game, we would have the number one pick right now. I know. And we'd be a game up on a win up on the Rams and the Broncos. Cause we'd have only two wins. And what sucks is the lions are getting the Rams number one pick. Yeah. Yeah, it's Detroit makes me a little nervous. I'm not going to lie. See what they did. I know the Jags aren't that good, but still. You know what? It's just, it was a matchup game. I mean, not knocking the Lions and it was a good win. It was, it was a matchup. Um, I was listening to uh, a points handicapper uh, yesterday morning and, um, uh, and he was talking about this game. And why is my phone or my watch yelling at me? Um, and he was talking about that game and he's like, you know, the, the Jags are, they're not a terrible team, but the way this matchup plays out, I expect the lions to come out and just, and put a, a butt whooping on them and win by a running away. Um, that's really what happened. So we'll see. I mean, not this isn't again, it's not a knock on the lines. It was a nice win, but NFL sometimes matchups are, are, you know, doesn't matter who's good or who's bad. It's, it's a matchup game. Yeah, no, you're right. You're right. But I mean, regardless, the Lions are going to have a really good draft position this year because they're going to have their own and then they're going to have the Rams pick. And you know, the Lions are what five and seven now. So yep. their own pick might not be spectacular, but if you get the Rams pick, that's going to be a pretty dang good pick. 
But yeah, you know, it's it's one of those things where it's like, okay, you look at where the bears are, and the higher you get, the more desperate other teams are going to get. And the Lions are going to want a quarterback. We know that. Mm -hmm. There are going to be other teams that might be looking at a quarterback that haven't been good. Obviously, the Texans are, but they're going to be ahead of you, so that doesn't really do you any good. But, I mean, just everybody and their mother knows that the reason the Bears want as good of a draft pick as possible is because they can trade back, because they already have their quarterback. I mean, we, we all know that. We don't see them... I mean, I don't see them picking second, obviously, but like, even if they were third, they're not, you're not going to pick a quarterback at that spot. And it's going to be tempting to trade back. It would be ideal to have the second spot, but trading back is really what we want at the end of the day. And the, the higher, the, the better the draft position, the better that they can get in a return in a potential return, especially if there is a desperate team out there. I really am curious to see if the Broncos or the Rams win another game this year. I I could see both of them winning one more game, but I don't think that they win any more than one game. Would you say that's a fair assessment with the way they're going? I don't know, but based on the play, I haven't, I haven't gone through. Let me look at their schedules quick while we're just here. Um, Rams schedule. Um. So the Rams play the Raiders on Thursday night. <clears throat> Potential win. The Raiders are terrible. Yeah, but the last few weeks, haven't they been playing a tad better? Not saying that makes them good now, but <laughs> oh, whoa, 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 whoa. a Christmas miracle. Christmas Day, the Broncos play the Rams. Oh my. Oh, it's gonna end in a tie, isn't it? It that's the that would be the best scenario. Would that then, be something? Because then they would get a half win each and the Bears would stay ahead of them. Oh, man. Wouldn't that be something? Hey, we saw a tie this week. Commanders and Giants, maybe it can happen then. Yeah. So the Rams play the Raiders. That's, I mean, I'm the Raiders aren't good. They are playing better, but it's, that's not, that's a game that's not completely unwinnable. No, then of course the, not. The Rams play the Packers. Again, that's a winnable game because I, I think I think that I think the Packers will win that game. Well, here's the thing: what if they shut down Aaron Rodgers and the Rams suck? They still have a good defense; they just can't score. Yeah, and, if they had Matt Stafford, I think then yes, but uh, I I don't know. Um, just saying is it's not like the Packers are good. That's that if if the Rams won, I wouldn't be like, oh my goodness, that's crazy. Um, then they play the Broncos. Somebody's got to win that game. They play the Chargers. I don't think they win that one. Then they play the Seahawks, and that's probably not going to be a, a win either. Um, so there's a couple of win- winnable games in there for the Rams. The Broncos, they play the Chiefs next. Chiefs coming off a loss, zero percent chance the Broncos win that one. Um, then they play the Cardinals. I don't see them winning that one. They play the Rams. Somebody's got to win that one. Tie, tie, tie. Then they play the Chiefs again. That's going to be a loss. And then, <laughs> then they play the Chargers. So. Mm. The Broncos, the Broncos are the, the, the scarier team as far as who's going to who's going to have a terrible record. And you know what? I don't think the Bears. Here, here's what here's my thing with the Bears. The next two games are the Eagles and the Bills. Like Bears are losses, period. Right. The last two is Detroit and the Vikings. Now, the Vikings is the final game. Could they be playing for something or not? Could they be battling with Philly for home field? They might have something for the bye week. So could there be something to play for from in in, in Minnesota? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. That's that I think is going to be the determining factor. Detroit, 
our defense sucks. They can score. I think they can beat us. That Vikings game will be interesting, though. Um, I, I wonder if they'll rest, guys. Because, honestly, isn't that getting kind of out, like, out of vogue? Um, Wait, the, you mean the Bears? No, no. The, or the, the Vikings. Vikings resting. Isn't that because, you know, then they'll have a two-week layoff if they rest their starters. You know, do they want – then they – you know, teams have come out flat when they do that. Right, but uh, okay – that's fair, but here's a question too: Is let's say the Vikings don't have the one number one seed locked up, and they could play for it, they're going to play for that. If oh, they if they either have it or they don't have it, I don't know if they'll necessarily rest everybody, but I think they're going to take a few steps back. They're not going to play at a hundred percent. Yeah, I just, I don't know. I, I just. <laughs> At this point, there's four games left. If they lose all four, I'm I'm okay with it because I want to see I want to see what happens because this really is um, people trade trade up for the most part and give up a lot for quarterbacks. They don't give up a lot necessarily for um, other players. They give up a lot for quarterbacks and. Um, this is two, maybe three quarterback draft in the, in the high end, or maybe even in the first round, at least in the first half of the first round, there's, there's only three quarterbacks and that's Bryce young. Who's probably going number one overall Mm -hmm. CJ Stroud from Ohio state and will leave us from Kentucky. Yeah. And it's, going to be let's say you get the third you know i mentioned if you get the third you could still probably trade back it's just be how desperate would there be a potential team to get him i'm sure there'd be someone that would want it's going to all lay out that's what it's going to depend on if you got this going to have somebody that oh you know it's it's going to be interesting to see and you really want as high as possible here I have a I have a tanking question for you. Mm-hmm. This might sound batshit stupid, and I'm going to risk sounding batshit stupid. Let's say you play Justin Fields against the Eagles and the Bills, and then at least for the final game against the Vikings, do you just say, "All right, Justin, sit this one out, get ready for next year," regardless of what there- the Vikings are playing for? They're not going to sit Justin Fields unless he is either injured or at risk of injury. Which we won't know until then. I mean, something could happen between now and then. I'm just speaking hypothetically. Like, even if he was just like a little bit sore or just wasn't feeling 100%, but he said he could play, even if he's not 100%, I would feel like they'd be extra cautious in that point. I'm just wondering if like, if he was fully healthy, would there be any chance of that? I I would think that they would let him play, but it is something I do ask and think about is maybe a possibility in that last game. I don't know. I want to get your opinion on that. I would, I don't think so. I would be absolutely shocked. Like I would be absolutely shocked. Um, They're, they're going to play Justin Fields. They're the players on the field, the coaches on the sideline. They're going to try to win every game they can. Um, and I don't think Ryan Poles is going to do anything to pull rank to try to tank. Um, but he's probably going, man, this is going to make this rebuild a lot easier. If, if we, uh, are able to trade back and, and in the, the higher up they have the, the easier it is, the the bigger, the haul they're going to get. Yeah. Um, so that's, I mean, that's the, really the hope and uh, you know, to, to go back to the Brad Biggs kind of argument, it's like, sure. It, it would be nice to have a few wins, but the, you know, if we get the high pick, the likelihood that that is an empire impact player is better. Um, and if we trade back, 
having two really good bites at the apple also makes it easier to to make uh improvement for next year you know the bears have a huge amount of cap space to spend next year but they're not going to spend that all no no they're they're not not. going to spend even a big chunk because look at the free agent classes is um you know you're probably going to take a couple of big swings and then you're going to fill with guys that you can are like second and third wave free agents. Um, you're the goal. Ryan Bowles told us like, it is not a secret with Ryan pace. It was smoke and mirrors and, and subterfuge. And it was with Ryan Poles. He told you what he's going to do. You build through the draft and the, you know, a few years ago, I should probably go through it and do it again, but I went through like a 10 year period of NFL drafts and no team really drafted that much better than other teams. Like it, it was, it wasn't like, Oh, Hey, this is the best team. The best teams draft the best. It was the teams that that were considerably better had didn't have a higher hit rate. They had more picks. And because they they had the same hit rate, but they had more picks, they had a better number of players that worked out. And yeah, I mean that's the nature of football. The more you have, the more likely you are to succeed because you can make quote the right pick, but things can be completely altered by an injury or a system. I mean, it's really football drafting is some of the biggest crapshoot out there, considering the violent nature of the sport. So the more you have, the more likely you are to succeed. And that's, I mean, that's why Ryan Poles was trading back so much in that last draft. He was just trying to create some capital. And even if they were later round picks, it's better to bring in some rookies and have a higher pool of rookies because you'll have a more likely percentage of finding somebody. And I want to, I want to completely make a left-hand turn here real quick um, for our listeners. And I know this won't impact you right now because Um, by the time you listen to this, this game will be over, but so I have a daughter who just turned eight recently and she's an actress. Um, and she was hired to be in the Toyota holiday commercial and it made its debut on television on NBC the other night, um, during the Christmas at Rockefeller center, uh, uh, special, and it's going to be played on halftime of Sunday night football starting tonight with the Cowboys and uh, Colts game. And it's going to be in the halftime of every single Sunday night football game during the month of December. So that's amazing. Um, that's I've, so cool. I, I've seen the commercial and it's, you know, as a, as a dad, it made me really proud. Um, and uh, it, it was, a, it's a big deal, you know, um, so if uh, if any of our fans are watching Sunday Night Football, stick around during um, the halftime show and watch the Toyota commercial. It starts off with uh, two people working in a grocery store. My daughter is the little girl. Obviously, she's eight. So check that out. Um, you know, we're we're about as we're recording this, we're about midway through the uh the first quarter. So um, yeah, it's exciting. I, that I've seen is the, so cool. I've seen the commercial a bunch of times because Toyota on their YouTube channel posted it. So I've seen it there, but just seeing it live on television is a, uh, it's going to be exciting. That is so, so awesome. Congrats to her. That's amazing. When was that shot that, that commercial? So it's funny. It's a Christmas commercial. It's, and there's all kinds of snow outside and you see people bringing in their Christmas tree and shoveling snow. They filmed it in August in uh, the suburbs of Chicago. And my daughter was like sweating like a pig. She just having to stop and wipe her the sweat off her face because she was wearing a winter coat and a winter hat. And (laughs) you know, what's really funny is that that reminds me, you know, the movie, it's a wonderful life. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that was all fake snow, and that was shot in like 80, 90 degree weather when they when they were shooting outside in um, Bedford Falls. And, you know, even the scene when George Bailey's running, hello, 
movie house. You know, that whole thing that was shot in like 90 degree weather with fake snow. So it, it's kind of like that. Yeah. So my daughter kept playing with the snow. So like they had a snow machine, but then ap- <laughs> apparently a lot of the snow was styrofoam. See, they, they get creative. Sometimes it's styrofoam. Sometimes it's like, I think like potato flakes they used in a Christmas story. That was all fake snow. It's kind of interesting to see how they, they execute that in commercials and movies. Yeah. So uh, I, I was bummed. I didn't get to go on the set because of, covid restrictions they limited the number of people so she could only have one parent go so my wife went um and it was a uh and like they weren't allowed to take pictures or anything so um yeah i I didn't get to see any of it but so it was all a surprise when i saw the final product i didn't know i knew what the plot was but i had didn't i hadn't seen anything and um yeah. Well, that's really amazing. Again, congrats to her. And I, I look forward to seeing it. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so back to the bears, uh, you know, and this game and, 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 you know, just to end that point um, is why I'm okay with losing because winning a single game can have a huge shift on where they're picking and their ability to draft or trade back. And even if they don't trade back and if they stay with a high draft pick, um, drafting a guy like Will Anderson from Alabama or Jalen Carter from Georgia will absolutely change the, mm. the, the trajectory of this team and the way that that defensive line plays. I don't know if you watched the – the uh, SEC championship game, but Jalen Carter just absolutely dominated. Yeah. I mean, I saw the tape, I saw the highlights and everything they were showing from him. And that's more relevant than ever because in this past game against the green Bay Packers, Aaron Rodgers didn't get touched a single time. You know, even worse than that is where the, that game and you know, jumping back into the game, the biggest turning point of that game is when the Green Bay Packers started running it down the Bears' throats and the yep. Bears couldn't stop the run. Yep. That was the biggest factor in this game. And that was supposed to be the big factor the other way. The Packers can't stop the run. And uh and the Bears should have been able to with the running attack run the ball and it goes to part of the point is is the bears running game really smoke and mirrors that is justin fields and people picking up a few big plays because the bears have run it so much with justin fields without justin fields is the bears get running game very potent at all well i think not having khalil herbert makes a big difference how I think that's a though? factor of it because they still have David Montgomery, who is their starting running back. Right. But you know, they're, they're not totally different, but you know, Khalil Herbert, I think uses that strength a little bit more. And, you know, you kind of have with Dave Montgomery, he's not quick or nimble, but he's able to kind of get that extra yardage by bouncing off players. I mean, the way I saw it today, and you know, this is just my perspective. I just think the Packers were ready for the run. I think they were prepared for it. They just, they were able to swarm. They were able to get there. They were able to clog the lanes, fill the holes. I I still think the bears have a solid running game, but I mean, Justin Fields accounts for a lot of those running yards and Justin Fields didn't run nearly as much today as he did in previous weeks, which kind of makes sense because he's coming off injury. He had the running touchdown. He had a few little scrambles, but he wasn't running all over like crazy today. I mean, it was a lot more running with your backs. I mean, they ran like several wildcats today, which drove me freaking nuts. So, I, I mean, the way I saw it today was I think the Packers were just prepared for it. Yeah, you know, so the Bears, on the other hand, I think they knew the Packers would be running the ball in the second half. And that's that's really when the Packers are the most dangerous is when they're they're able to run the ball. 
And yeah, because look at all the passing they did in the first half, and it didn't really work for them. And the Bears just really had no answer for it. Um, I, it, it's, it's just we knew this team coming into the season was going to be susceptible to the run. And I, and, you know, n- knowing it academically and then watching it happen live, it's, it's, you're still not prepared for it. Right. Right. And you knew they were going to make adjustments at halftime, you know, when they only had, I mean, we gave up what 10 points to them in the first half, the one mm-hmm. touchdown coming with the final 17 20 seconds. seconds. Yeah. 17 seconds, whatever it was on a fourth down, you knew they were going to make adjustments because man, I'll tell you, that was not the Aaron Rodgers we're used to. Some of those throw that was, that was not what we were used to. Those throws looked weak. They were underthrown at times. They were overthrown a little bit. And I think a big turning point in the game, even though this happened later, was the pass interference. That was on Jones, I believe. If he turns his head, he could have picked that. That was a very underthrown ball. At the very least, it would have been incomplete. But that pass interference set up that drive. And he just had to turn his head. It was a very underthrown ball. My whole point being is Aaron Rodgers was not slinging like Aaron Rodgers. He had under 200 passing yards. And if they had any sort of pass rush, it, it would they, they would have scored even less the way they were going. But to your point, they made the adjustments in the second half. The Bears couldn't stop the run. The Bears still had a chance to win if they would have completed some of those drives. But, you know, again, the, the play calling on our end got very conservative. And I don't know if that was by design to intentionally tank this game, like some people want to believe, but it just, they weren't getting it in the end zone. I just have a hard time believing that the coaching staff is intentionally trying to tank. I do too. I really do too. But you also have to agree that some of those play calls were a little mind numbing, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and that's, that's been, a frustrating part of Getze is the the fact that he just suddenly gets super conservative. And I, I don't know if that's, I don't know where that comes from because, you know, most NFL coaches are very aggressive in nature. It's just like, you know, be part of the game. And, and then they get so conservative with the play calling. And I'm hoping it's that that's a, the product of being a first year head coach or sorry, first year play caller. And as, as the season, you know, winds up and, you know, you reflect on things in the off season, because honestly it's, it's real tough in, in between weeks or between games, sitting down and evaluating yourself. It's you travel back from the game home, you are watching film for the next game and implementing a game plan and going to practices and you're not going back and, you know, evaluating your own performance per se. Um, that's, that's what you do in bye week That's what you do in off season is, is reflect on, Hey, where, where did my play call go or go wrong? Um, and, and you tweak your playbook for the, the players you have and and you just hope that uh, you develop as a play caller and that's the hope because i don't think getsy's offense is is bad i think we've seen it really work but we need to see um we need to see improvement on putting your foot on the gas and, and really going from there Yeah, I mean, Luke Getzey is obviously a big, big upgrade over what we had. And we have an offense that can move the ball, actually can move the ball. It's just suddenly these, it's like, it's they just decide to be super conservative. I mean, today you get deep into the Green Bay territory. You have a penalty. It's what, first and 19 or whatever it was. And you're running on first and like, what are you doing? And virtually every time I swear it's second and long, they run the ball. I just, I don't get it. And 
I get why you want to be somewhat more careful with Justin Fields coming off the injury, but I wasn't asking for more design runs, but why wasn't he rolling out a little bit more today? Why on certain downs when you had like third and five, th- th- those are times when you can roll Justin Fields out and you can try to see if he can complete a pass. And if not, he can use his legs to pick up a first down. I, I just, I felt like that was the difference between winning and losing a game. How much you value wins. Obviously we just had a huge discussion on that, but just from an in-game standpoint, you had multiple opportunities. You had that great completion in Nikhil Harry. That was an amazing catch. And then it was just conservative, conservative, conservative. Yeah, the, the, Nikhil, Harry, the Nikhil Harry throw and catch was great because the placement of that ball uh, was it was either incomplete or Nikhil Harry was catching it. That was a not interceptable ball. And Nikhil Harry went up and got it. Um, so that was awesome. Um, you know, Justin Fields threw some really great balls in that game. And it was nice. I, I want to find that balance of him running the ball and him staying in the pocket. And I, I want to find that right balance because his legs are a weapon, but I don't want him to become like a running quarterback where his, his shelf life is shortened because uh, he takes too many hits is, but when he's got, you know, that the touchdown run, when that lane is open, take it, take yeah. it and, and, mm-hmm. and go. I, I just want to have less of the designed runs. Um, yes, I agree. But roll him, you know, put uh, what I would love to see more of is plays where you use his legs to put a defender in an uncomfortable position where you roll out and that defender either has to come up to apply pressure to Justin Fields, but then potentially leave a, a receiver open or stay with that receive or receiver and then let Justin Fields run. And it's, that's how you create matchup mismatches is um, you, uh, you know, you put players in uncomfortable positions where they have to make a decision on like a, a big de- split decision. And, um, and you know, the certain, certain times, like when, if you have a single defender, that's, uh, you know, on a rollout, like he's in a no win situation, either Justin Fields is going to pick up some yards on his legs, or he's going to come up and try to force Justin Fields to throw it. And then he's going to throw it and <laughs> pick up even some more yards. Um, you know, we had that nice one to Cole Komet. And those are the types of plays I want to see him use his legs um, down in the red zone. Um, you know, when, when plays break down, when uh, he sees a running lane, um, you know, th- those types of plays, I, I want to be able to develop because the guy's got a cannon of an arm and we saw some really great throws today. We did. We saw two deep balls, one to Nikhil Harry, one to St. Brown. He made a few nice throws to Cole Komet. I really liked seeing that. I mean, he was moving the ball very well in the air through most of the game. And I think that taking the the ball out of his hands did the Bears, from an in-game perspective, a disservice. It was very disappointing to see. I'm like, let the kid cook. Why are you running on first to 19? Why can't you at least try to throw the ball and get some of those chunk yards back? Why, when you completed that pass to Harry, you immediately went back to the ground game again instead of trying to be more aggressive? That just really, really irked me. And it's a shame the game had to end on a sour note because you know all everyone's going to be talking, oh, well, you know, he threw the interception, blah, 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 blah. The first interception, uh, I partially it's on him. Yes. Because yes, because that's that's a timing route, and he threw it a little bit late. Yes. But it's I would say it was it's sixty forty on the receiver because that receiver didn't come back at all, and and um, I think that was Equinemia St. Brown. It was. And you know you've got to when you turn to make that uh, to 
to make the play on the ball and you see the defender defender undercutting you, you got to go in there. You've got to be physical. And he didn't, he just let him take it. And, and it was a late throw uh, on a timing route. And that shouldn't even be Equidemia St. Brown in there. That should be a real receiver that that should be a Mooney or a Claypool, um, you know, exactly. And, 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 but you know, as a receiver, you have to help out your quarterback. And on that throw, you need to be in there is believe me, um, you know, a big time receivers are, are fighting with that cornerback and not letting him take it. Yeah. Any, I mean, it, yeah. If, it, if that's Cooper cup, that's a different story. You know, you're, you're going to either, you're either going to find a way to make that catch. You're going to break it up and, and cause an incomplete. Yeah. You don't let that get intercepted. And the second that the last one that ended the game, that was a product of pressing. You it know, was desperation. Hey, it's desperation. And, you know, you're trying to make something happen and I, I I'm okay. I'm okay with those because the more Justin Fields flings it around, the more film he has, the more experience he has of what is an open window and what's not. And the, the sooner you realize that's an open window, that is not an open window. I can get a ball in there. I can't get a ball in there is the your confidence goes through the roof and you're able to make these plays. Exactly. And I think that this kind of goes to show that there are still things that need to be worked out. This is still a growing process. Justin Fields is not a finished product. I don't think that that interception takes away the good that he did today. I'm not going to sit there and be like everything that he did was irrelevant. Those deep balls, the moving the feet in the pocket to try to find Cole Komet, those kinds of things that doesn't take away from the performance of Justin Fields today. Not at all. So build on the goods, learn from the bads. I think if you look at the performance as a whole, I, I'm pretty happy with it. I mean, the yardage for the completions he made was pretty good through a lot of the game. He completed like, 80% of his passes, granted, he wasn't throwing a whole ton, but still, he was he looked good today, and I wasn't sure how good he was going to look coming off the injury, but I think he stepped up pretty well. So, you know, all in all, even though it was a sour ending, that perfor- overall performance by Justin Fields outside the, the last interception, you know, you could say, yeah, we kind of got what we've wanted. We got a performance from our quarterback, and we tanked lost. I I agree. You know, um, it's again, it sucks to lose to the Packers, but we have to keep our eye on, on the long term, which is, which is we want to create a team that owns this division for a long time. And, and here's the thing is, is the Vikings window is, is right now. And they're going to, they're going to plummet once this window closes um, because they're going to have to figure out a quarterback situation and they're going to run into some cap problems and this is their window and that's it. The, the Viking or the Packers, their, their window is rapidly closing and um, you know, having Aaron Rodgers in that contract is going to make it hard for them to bring in weapons for him and you're going to have to start dismantling some of those high priced defensive players to, to keep your cap. Um, really, the future is going to be the Bears and probably the Lions fighting for the division title and and, you know, being being wise and drafting well and basically creating a, uh, you know, uh, a draft machine where you're constantly growing your number of draft picks and building your f- foundation through good drafts. You're going to be a healthy salary cap and um, maintain that window. 
if you yeah, draft absolutely and the better you draft the it's not just a, oh hey we've plugged that hole it's when you draft poorly you have to redraft that position or spend free agency dollars to fill that position for every time you miss on a on a draft on a high draft pick and that's when you you really start hurting yourself you draft you know that's why it seems that pick the wrong quarterback high in a, a draft really they really struggle because um it's uh it's they're they're having to they've already sunk that draft pick they've sunk the financials into the quarterback and they still have to f- solve that problem either with a free agent quarterback or more draft picks and it sets the team back so you can you can suck it you know suck it up and and absorb you know the the fifth sixth seventh round draft picks potentially but those early draft picks like you've really got to hit on those and you've got to hit on some of those later round picks and in order to to build a successful because you know if you're if you hit and hit big time on your first round pick you know you get either a stud quarterback or a stud wide receiver or a or an elite edge rusher or something, uh, you know, a 12 year starter and left tackle that goes, all right, that's a position that we don't have to solve anymore for years and years to come. And it lets you focus on other positions to do them right. And so that's why the, the, the draft is so important. Right on, right on. Um, but yeah, I mean the Bears. I, I you still see that offensive line not looking good, not able to open up holes in the run game. Um, pass protection was meh, but the run was not very good. Um, you're seeing improvement from Cole Komet, which is good. Mm-hmm. And, That's and what I, I like seeing. And I think you're probably in this off season going to hear at least hear about if not getting it done an extension for him um you know if if you're looking at it some of that money that the bears have in in cap space is going to go to uh extending guys so probably darnell mooney's a candidate um jaylon johnson's a candidate cole Komet is a candidate um I think anybody who else is a candidate, uh, a legit candidate for an extension. Um, I mean, some people could argue Montgomery, but I'm still not big on extending running backs. You know, I, 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 I don't think he's back. I really don't. I don't either. Uh, um, I mean, I think he's probably going to be trying to get out ten million dollars a year. And I would not go more than six. Not that he's not worth it. It just, I think you have to put a, a cap number that you're comfortable with for that position, regardless of who it is. Because, you know, quarterback, this is a quarterback price. You know, wider. This is a wide receiver price. This is an elite defensive edge rusher price. But there's certain pieces where you're just like, I, I can't, I can't pay top dollar for that. That's not how you win a play or put together a winning team. You know, with uh, a ten to twenty million dollar running back. Right. Ex- yeah. Exactly. I. That's why you can go and replace that fairly easily and look where running backs are drafted you get them in later rounds so it's not like you need to draft a Saquon Barkley to have something successful when was Montgomery drafted the fourth round the fifth round fifth round fifth round yeah so there you go I that's the thing is you can find guys to replace in the running back position it's not like you're drafting a quarterback um and and honestly is, I mean, we know that 
Khalil Herbert will be back next year. I wouldn't mind if they if they re-signed Darrington Evans. He's looked pretty good. And that wouldn't cost you. No, you're looking at probably a two million dollar contract per year. That's a drop in the bucket. Yeah. And I, I think and he makes it because who knows what uh I'm having an old man moment. The uh the third running back, the one they drafted this year. Um I who knows what he's gonna be like. He was a late round pick. Who knows? He might not pan out. But Darrington Evans gives you that ability to go, oh, all right, we we let David Montgomery walk. Khalil Herbert is our primary. Darrington Evans is our second second uh secondary running back. And either the the rookie of the guy we drafted last year steps up or we'll probably pick another late round running back and um and then you know have them all compete for playing time. And I think that's that's how you replace David Montgomery for much, much cheaper. Yeah, exactly. Um, on defense, the, the Bears are just a disaster. Uh, you know, it's it's so tough to judge the defensive backs because there's quarterbacks just have a clean pocket forever to throw. Like I said, Aaron Rodgers wasn't even touched once today, not once. Even on blitzes, he had all day. Um, it and it's just tough I mean, without a, without a pass rush. You know that's that's going to be a huge, huge thing for to to deal with in the off season. Is the ability to get to the quarterback and. Um, I, you know, if, if they can't, if they can't solve that problem in the off season, you know, we're in for another tough, tough, uh, season next year, because they have to not only get pressure on the quarterback, but they need to be able to stop the run and allow, allow the linebackers to like fill those gaps instead of letting offensive linemen get to the second level and really dictate things. Right. Um, but yeah, it was a the it was a it was a tough game to sit there and watch. And I missed part of it because my daughter had a uh orchestra performance today and uh and so we were at the the auditorium um on Northwestern's campus watching it and and in between uh, intermissions I would I would put the game on my phone and, and watch. <laughs> and, uh, and then before the performance started, I had to drop her off because they took pictures and they, they'd, you know, um, were getting ready. And so I had like an hour and a half to kill. So I caught a big chunk of it there too. So it was, a, uh, um, it was just, it was tough because you knew that first half that a lot of that was a mirage that the bears Bears had the lead versus the the Packers. You knew that this was going to change come fourth quarter. Yeah, and I'll, I'll give the Bears defense credit in the first half. They they were locking down in the secondary pretty well for what they had. But like I said earlier, you knew they were going to adjust. Yeah, I mean, this team needs a lot of speed. Um, the one touchdown that was the um. The, the one touchdown that was like uh, the sweep, that was just lack of speed, lack of angles. Right. Um. So, yeah, I, I don't really know what else to say about this game. It was. It, the loss is beneficial to the Bears, but it, it was just it's tough to swallow and it's tough, tough to watch another loss to the stupid Packers. Yeah. And the only good thing about it is, you know, at least now when the Packers win, you know that that people in Illinois aren't, you know, kids growing up in Illinois aren't going like, oh, man, the Packers are so good. I want to be a Packers fan because the Packers super suck this year. 
Yeah, that was a thing for a long time. It really was. Uh, all right, where do you want to move on from here? You know, hot stove is here. Hot stove is here. There are rumors. Things are starting to move on the market a little bit. We've seen some signings. I think this week can get pretty crazy. Yeah, I mean, uh, the the winter meetings are here. Um, I, I, you know, you're starting to see some signings here and there. And um, Jose Abreu got a big deal. Yes, he did. Three years, what, $60 million with the Astros? His his three-year deal is bigger than the th- last three-year deal that the White Sox gave him. He got more money. Um, so I was shocked that that value. I thought I thought you could get away with giving him a two-year deal. And I, the money that he got was way higher than my expectation. And, um, I, I mean, I think they, it, this is this is going to help the Astros, who just won a World Series, be even better. You know what? They're not afraid to overpay people. No, I'm, I'm not, not saying you have to overpay everybody. You do have to be intelligent with your spending to a point. But you know what? Sometimes you just have to take a little bit of a risk and they're a team that wins every year. You think they're, you think if they get two out of three good years and they have one bad year from Jose Abreu, but they're still winning, you think they're going to sweat about it too much? I don't think so. You know, it's, there's overpaying. And then if, if you have a guy that ends up being productive and you overpaid for him, you go, meh, it's when you, they, they become a Jason Hayward and they're not productive and you overpaid for them. That's the one that's tough to swallow. So right. if, if Jose Abreu puts up numbers like he did this year, which I think was a fairly down year, not a terrible year, but just a, a tick down, um, you know, mostly in the power numbers, you're like, and, and you paid $20 million a season for three seasons for him. You're like, okay, we paid a little too much for him, but you're getting productivity. You're getting a, a, a what, a four war player ish, three and a half war or something. And I think he is going to love those Crawford boxes, MMA Park. Probably. I mean, I think he's going to do real well there. I mean, you're going to the defending world champs, a team that's been to the LCS. At the very least, what, the past six, seven years? Yeah. Over that stretch, they've at minimum made the LCS. I mean, they lose Yuli Gurriel, who is older. All right, we'll replace him with another all-star. Look at the Houston Astros. They've lost Carlos Correa. They lost George Springer a while back. They lost Garrett Cole. Now they're losing Yuli Gurriel. And they just replace them and they keep winning. That was the type of sustained success that I was really hoping we'd see with the Cubs post-2016. I, I would agree with that. That's that's what we wanted. That's what we strived for. <clears throat> um so yeah, I mean this is this is um since 2014. This is the list of WRC pluses that Jose Abreu ended the year with 167, 131, 121, 139, 114, 115, 164, 127, 137. Um, hmm. You know, so you're, you're paying a guy, but he's um, and his war since 2014 5 f4 uh 5.3 3.3 1.9 4.4 1.7 1.6 2.9 2.7 and 3.9 so um the power numbers were down this year but his war was up he was a um great walk, hitter his walks his walks were right on i mean this was the second best walk rate he's ever had this season. Mm-hmm. And he 
and he cut down his strikeouts. His strikeouts went from the previous three seasons were 21.9, 22.5, 21.7, down to 16.2. So um, he he finished with 304 average, slash 304, 378, 446. Uh, you know, he put the ball in play. He got hits. Um, he didn't strike out a ton. Um, just, you know, that's, that's a good pickup. It's a real good pickup. And, you know, the rumor is the White Sox made a last ditch effort for him, but clearly, clearly, uh, it was not nearly enough money. Kind of makes you feel like that whole, oh, we tried to keep him, but it wasn't meant to be. You saw that release statement by Jerry Reinsdorf, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it was, he could have just not written that and opened it or wrote a check. And listen, if you're a White Sox fan and you say, you know what, we have too many DHs, we need to have Andrew Vaughn as our future first baseman. I understand that. I really do. I think the problem that a lot of White Sox fans seem to have is that it wasn't the best send off. Like, him sitting out the last day of the season and him having to come out saying, Oh yeah, no, 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 no. That was, that was my decision. It's like, yeah, right. Okay. It's the fact that they didn't were white Sox fans weren't given the opportunity to say the proper goodbye to Jose Abreu that he deserved. You know, having too many DHs is not a big problem when the guys can play other positions. So, um, you know, you have two, two of those DHs can play corner outfield spots. You know, obviously you don't want them there every day, but you've got three slots to fit. You've got the corner outfield, first base, and actually DH. And you've got three guys to fill those spots. Uh, you know, why, why can't? Why can't uh, Eloy play, you know, split time between DH and corner outfield and Vaughn sw- split time between first base DH corner outfield and Jose Abreu switch between first base and DH. Andrew Vaughn should not be playing outfield period. It, he was, he was horrible defensively last year. Like he, ungodly he, terrible, but you know what? Kyle Schwarber was horrible too. And he got not better. that bad. Here's the thing. Andrew Vaughn is not the best athlete. He's a great hitter, but he's not the best athlete. And I think it's fair to speculate that his hitting kind of slumped a little bit towards the end because he just wasn't playing the right position. I don't know how much that factored in, but I think if he plays his natural position, he'll be a more consistent hitter. Hey, I mean, have you seen Andrew Vaughn's defensive metrics? I have not. Well, uh, I'm going to look that up really quick because they're really, really, really bad. He shouldn't, he should never play outfield again, frankly. And it, it may be, you might not think of it that way if you don't kind of look at the stats or really rewatch what he did in the field. But in the outfield last year, he was a minus 14 defensive run saved. His ultimate zone rating was minus 10.5. His ultimate zone rating by 150 was negative 20.7. There's nothing like a good stat to make you feel like, man, that my take was not good. <laughs> I mean, his stat cast fielding runs prevented negative 14. Defensive keep- runs saved negative 14. How does that compare to Eloy? Let's take a look, shall we? And, and keep in mind, Eloy did miss a number of times, so there is going to be a little bit of a, you know, sample size, but let's take a look here. Okay, so in the outfield, negative two DRS. 
that's like a little step below average. UZR minus 0.1. UZR 150 minus two. It's not good, but it's kind of teetering towards average. So keep in mind, negative two def- defensive runs saved for Eloy Jimenez for Andrew Vaughn minus 14. Uh, it's just it just sucks because the White Sox are not this is not addition by subtraction by losing Jose Abreu and unless somehow they are like oh hey we're going to spend that money that we would have spent on Jose Abreu on another position of need but they haven't done that. Well, yeah. And that's something that needs to happen first. They obviously have to do it. Um, can I just make one more point about Andrew Vaughn? I don't mean to rub this in, but I want to make one more point. Oh, go for it. So here's Andrew Vaughn's hitting stats last year, 271, 321, 429 with a WRC plus of 113. That's pretty good, right? Yeah. You know, his overall F4 as a player was, he was a negative F4 player with that slash line. Uh, that's how bad his defense was. His overall defensive value was negative 26.7. I'm done. Uh, but, you know, really the, the money the White Sox have spent this offseason was A.J. Pollock declined his player option with the White Sox, and then they essentially used that, that same money to sign Mike Clevenger. Who has a knee problem and came off Tommy John? Yeah. So Clevenger is going to earn $8 million. And I believe you saved about $8 million from AJ Pollock declining his option. Mm -hmm. So, so far you are net zero on money. And, um, I don't know how that Clevenger move is going to, you know, you're saying knee problems, but doesn't he also have two Tommy Johns? Yes. And it isn't, I mean, I know this is not backed up by science. This is more anecdotal old wives tale kind of thing, but you recover really well and possibly even do better after one Tommy John. But after that second Tommy John, (laughs) um, you know, it's tough to come back from that second time. Yeah. I mean, you know, people have obviously done it, but yeah, it's, it's easier said than done. And I mean, your guess is as good as mine on what they're going to do. What, uh, what you're going to see from Mike Clevenger this year, who knows, who knows it could be good. It could be bad. It could be mediocre. I really don't know. I really, really don't know. But, you know, it's one of those things where it's it's risky. It's it's risky if that is your primary starting pitching move. If you're not planning on making any other significant moves with the starting rotation, that is a lot of risk you're putting right there. If you make other big notable rotation moves that are a lot less risky on the surface, then that move becomes a lot less like, okay, are we really depending on this? But they got to make more moves in that rotation, in my opinion, to, I think, feel a bit more secure about that. And, and honestly, they still haven't shored up that second base issue. Um, and I thought a, a good option would have been for trading for Colton Wong and the Mariners ended up doing that. And I think that's a, yep, that's a missed opportunity. I and, thought Colton Wong would have been a great fit for the Sox. You know, I, I've heard some people like Colton Wong would have been a, such a white Sox move, but no, I that would have been a good I, move. You know, is it, I mean, could you do better if, you know, potentially, but not within the constraints of what the White Sox are trying to do? I think Colton Wong would be, uh, you know, a good one. Yeah, I thought the fit would have been there. I mean, I would hope for them that their solution isn't Romy Gonzalez. I uh, mean as your primary solution. I'm not saying he can't be part of like the depth, but as a primary solution. I I don't know. 
Um, it, it's they've got a lot of holes. Um, uh, Did you hear? I, I don't know how true this rumor is. White Sox Twitter has a very high percentage of sources, quote unquote, rumors you hear that you just don't really have a lot of faith that they're legit. But I thought I read somewhere and I can't remember where it was from or if it's legit or not, but I heard that they were kicking the tires on a Max Kepler trade at one point. I don't know how true it is. I don't know if it's still in the works. I don't know if it's something that was tried that didn't work out, but I know that was one thing that they were looking at, or at least that's what I heard. I don't know if it's true. I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah, that, that was another kind of eh one to me. Um, it, what about, I'm going to throw this one out there. Resigning Elvis Andrus and moving Tim Anderson to second base. Uh, it's not a great option. Be... It's not a great option. But if you look at the overall numbers of Elvis Andrews over the past five years, like the OPS, I believe, is below seven. And I know he played really good for you in his brief time, but uh, I don't know. I mean, you've. All right. So between Vaughn and in Eloy, you've got first baseman DH. Okay. Um, you still got a gaping hole at second. Shortstop, you've got fine. Um, what the hell is which of you on Moncada are you going to get? Yeah, you know, actually, I, the one take that I do have is that I do think that Yoan Moncada is going to rebound next year. I don't know to what extent, but I actually do think that I, I, if there's one person on that team that could see totally doing a 180 and rebounding the form, I think it's him. But who knows? Who knows? You're not gonna, I don't think you're going to trade him alone. I don't think right now he has the value of anything that would be worth it. I mean, so you still have a question. I mean, you know you're playing him at, sh at third. But you, yes. I would still call him a question mark because what what level of um you know confidence that you have do you have that he's going to be an impact player? Right. I mean, even if he can rebound to twenty twenty one form, I think people would happily take that. Um, you know, I keep hearing the name Gene Segura. And I know he he was in a cog in a, a Phillies team that went to the World Series, but he was also a cog in a Phillies team that looked like they were gonna like fizzle so bad, and they got a manager fired midseason. I don't think Gene Segura would be an awful choice for the Sox. I think that would be a fine one. If you look at his numbers; they're 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 solid. They're solid. What about the age number? <laughs> I mean, it is getting a little older, but I, I, I don't think Gene Segura would be the worst option there. Uh, Honestly, I think I, I, I feel like that the chances of them getting Gene Segura are decent. It's, it's again, it's, it's one of those things where you're like, we're talking about our big move being Gene Segura. Like on the surface, Gene Segura is not a bad move. But if it's your biggest position player move, that's not what you want. Oh, I, I'm I'm not saying it's ideal, and I'm not saying it's awful either. It's just, um, it's not the, it's not the, the move that I'm trying to make. Right, right. If if I'm really trying to contend. Yeah, I mean. Signing Gene Segura and adding a bunch of other pieces, I think that would be an acceptable option for the White Sox. It's just he can't be 
the guy, the big position player that you get. There's got to be more done. Yeah, I, I'm just looking at the holes here. And, um, you know, are Lurie Garcia at second? Uh, I don't think people want that. It does. Does it matter what people want? No, it does not. Um, Rick Hahn is going to send out a memo that uh, it is imperative that Lurie Garcia gets his at bats in his playing time. I wonder if that was part of Pedro Grafal's interview process. How many games are you planning to play Lurie Garcia? <laughs> <laughs> How many at bats do you envision him getting? Um, I mean, you've got question mark at third gaping hole at second question mark at catcher question mark in the, in the outfield and question mark in the starting pitching. Uh, and, and how much cap space do you, do you realistically um, expect them to, to spend? I think, that you are going to have to see them trade a big piece to get something. Yeah, let's see what their their cap is looking like for 2023. Um they're at 137, a little over 137 million right now for 2023. So um I I mean Liam Hendrick is making 14 million of that. If you trade him, you get net whatever the pieces you trade him for minus is 14 million and you get that. So what are you probably spending 30 you have 30 30 million dollars right now to spend in the off season to fill multiple positions still. If that's the, the guess we're going with, if it's somewhere around that threshold, then yes. Uh, 167. Does that seem fair? Yeah. 167, 170 at the yeah, most. So you're looking 30, 30, 30, 35 million dollars. Mm-hmm. And you've got, you've got at least one outfield spot. Um, a second base, uh, probably a catcher and another starting pitcher. Not a lot of room to work with there. You're no. you're, you're right. It's going to have to be real creative in the the trade market. I think Liam Hendricks is a big candidate to get traded away. I would think so. I mean, uh, I it would it would be it would be shocking if they didn't because he's a guy that can get you a return and it's, he's a one of your biggest payroll guys. Right. And you Uh, never know with closers, they can fall like a rock. Absolutely. Um, and who knows, uh, the, the A's apparently are moving closer to a, a Sean Murphy trade. Uh, doesn't sound like the White Sox are involved, though. I mean, the only team that I've heard ruled out are the Braves. They listed a bunch of other teams. They said the Guardians, the Cardinals, the Rays, I think. Are in or out? In. Oh, I, I've seen the only team that out is the Braves. Well, they said the Braves are out because the initial rumors that the Braves were closing in on them, and that turned out not the case. Yeah, I wonder. I mean, I would be shocked if he's not traded. I oh, he'll be he traded. Yeah, it's just it's a matter of where. Um, the, to the Cardinals. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a. Uh, it sounds like it sounds like spending is going to be back to pre-pandemic levels. And it sounds like we're going to, we're probably going to get some craziness and 
if what I'm hearing is true, that judge judge is going to be a domino that falls real quick. And that might open the floodgates for things. Sure. I mean, hey, you, you had a pretty big signing this Friday with Jacob DeGrom going to the Rangers. And boy, they paid him in money and years. Yeah, they did. I was I was shocked. Um, they gave him both. And, you know, that's a. Uh, it's going to be funny watching him pitch, you know, 17 starts a season for that kind of money. Yeah. Um, Other side of town, still the same thing. You're hearing a lot of Cubs linked to everybody. And the new one seems to be Dansby Swanson. Well, it was yesterday was Dansby Swanson. Today you're hearing more rumors about Xander Bogarts. Well, I'm, I'm seeing that the Red Sox have, quote, made a competitive offer to Xander Bogarts. I'm hearing that the Cubs have made Xander Bogarts one of their top priorities. Huh. <laughs> I saw it's another, all over the place. Oh, I know. It's all over I, the saw, place. I saw another article that said that um, Jed Hoyer, Jed Hoyer's dream is, or, you know, primary target is Trey Turner. So, <laughs> it's everybody's reporting something different. Yeah. I mean, and th- this is what it's usually like around this time. I mean, you're hearing rumors from everywhere, every, every nook, every cranny. I think that it's obviously the opinion of the, the mass. I, if you were to ask people, the, the choice would obviously be Bogarts and Correa over Dansby Swanson, right? I mean. Right. But if so, you're trying to maximize your dollar budget, I, I think Dansby Swanson's going to get. Shouldn't be a dollar budget. There shouldn't be, but there so will be. So aggravating. I don't, because I don't want, people are trying to tell me, and it's probably true. I'm not saying they're wrong. Oh, well, you don't think of Dansby Swanson, they'll be able to spread the money out more. How about you spend like a big market team like you are? I'm I'm with you. I am with you, and I will spend the Ricketts money like crazy. But I was literally going to say the same thing is if if they're given a – and this is not that I agree with it. It's just a reality situation. If Jed has X number of dollars to spend – and Dansby Swanson takes up less of those, you can add more players and spread it around. <laughs> but I don't agree with that. I'm just saying that might be a reality that we no, have to live with. Yes, yes. And and I'm not mad at you because that could be a reality. I'm just saying it's freaking ridiculous. Oh, I'm, listen, I'm, if, if I had Ricketts money, a Judge would be getting a big contract too. Because why, why not? You know how many home runs he would put in that bet those baskets? Sure. Sure. I know. Uh, I know. I, I mean, you're like, oh, hey, you know, Carlos Correa doesn't want to go to a rebuilding team, but then you go to Carlos Correa and be like, hey, listen, you know, we're going after Verlander and Judge and you. This is not going to be a rebuild for long. Like, all right, and it sounds a little better. Um, I have two words. Money talks money does talk money does talk look at look at Seeger and Simeon last year went to a trash rangers team because they paid them you and they were still trash with them jacob de gram could have stayed with the mets had a chance to win a world series no he went to texas because they paid him yeah money talks absolutely um, and I, you know, I, I would, if they got Dansby Swanson because they were lost out on the other three, I can live with it. If they're getting Dansby Swanson because they're cheaping out, not happy. Agreed. Agreed. And I do think that Dansby Swanson would move the needle. I said this on Twitter yesterday. I think he moves the needle, but he wouldn't move the needle nearly as much as the other ones. Look, Dansby Swanson is a great defender. And if you had Nico and Swanson up the middle, 
there's going to be very few balls getting through the middle of the infield, but I want that consistent spread out production that Xander Bogarts has, or the power that Correa has, or the balance of speed and power that Trey Turner has. I don't think Trey Turner is coming here. I think it would be more likely Turner going to the Phillies or somewhere else than the Cubs while the Cubs have a bigger chat at Bogarts or Correa or Swanson. But, you know, you get my point. I just, Swanson wouldn't move the needle nearly as much as the others. And I think you really need to get guys that move that needle big time. You know. Because you're more yeah, than one piece away. You are. You are. Um, but, you know, if you were to get those numbers from Dan Spee Swanson that you got last year, 277 average, 329 on base, 447 slugging, 25 home runs, 96 ribbies, 18 stolen bases, and a 6.4 war. Are you are you mad about that though? No. But I, I think I think most of uh, you know, not just you, most of our concern about Dansby Swanson is the last, not the last two years, but prior to that, um, his, he's a, he's a home run in the teens guy. Mm -hmm. I think we want more pop than that. Yes. We need it. Especially if Wilson Gutierrez isn't coming back. You know, if we get the numbers, we got the last two years, 27 and 25 home runs. All right. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. We could, we could live with that. Um, but I think the Trey Turners and, um, the, the Carlos Correa are, are more the, the, the people we're looking for where, um, Trey Turner, uh, you know, not last season, but the season before, um, 28 home runs last year, 21. Um, but he's a guy that that's had a slugging of, of over 500 multiple times. Right. That's, you know, that is significant. Um, so, and Correa, Correa is a power guy and at least they're all winners. They're all coming from winning programs. Yeah, I mean, Dansby Swanson has won a World Series. Carlos Correa has won a World Series. Trey Turner, Trey Turner won a World Series with the Nationals, mm -hmm. and then uh, Xander Bogarts has won World Series with the Red Sox. Right. Man, a lot of guy, a lot of these shortstops with over a six WAR would love to have a six WAR guy. Yeah, Ab. So. Uh, let's see how this progresses because it's, it's the biggest priority move, but also there are other many things the Cubs have to do. You'd like to see them during this time, get another pitcher and then maybe figure out their starting catcher. You've heard rumors about being interested in Christian Vasquez. And I think if you're not going to bring back Wilson Contreras, then someone like Christian Vasquez is probably one of your best bets. The guy's a really good defensive catcher. He's, for a catcher, not a bad hitter. He's turned himself into a decent hitter the past few years. He just won a World Series with the Astros, worked really well with that pitching staff. He, he Well, he was my guy when, you know, I put together my very early Cubs offseason, you know, Thing. I, that he was he was my catcher I, you know it's i would love to see wilson Contreras back but i i just don't think that happens no i'm not counting on it either and i kind of tweeted that my dream world would be you bring in christian vasquez to be catcher one then you come in and you bring wilson Contreras back and you make him your primary dh uh, that would be uh, nice 
you know, even even play him some first base. Yeah, even a little bit of first base. I, I yeah, just to get exactly that. Because you, you, yes. you know, like uh, like you know the I think the goal is to have Matt Mervis there, but um, you know, for if Matt Mervis has injuries or goes into a slump or dispel him, I think you need somebody that's that that can play some first base and we've seen Wilson Contreras play first base at times. And you know uh, what, if he's playing DH in first base, those legs are a lot fresher. And I think that you can sustain more three fifty OBPs and 20 to 25 home run seasons. Agreed. But I, I just, I just don't think he's coming back. You never say never, but I think the chances are small. Yeah. They're, they're real slim. Yeah. So yeah, um, Christian Vasquez, Omar Narvaez, those are the guys I would like to sign to catch. I think those two would be good options. Um, so Sada Sharma and Patrick Mooney of the Athletic are now reporting that uh the Cubs are checking in with Corey Kluber. You know, I don't want that to be their big move, but I think if he came along with some other pitchers this off season, I don't think that's an awful move. He was decent last year. And if you get him pretty cheap, as long as you're making other notable pitching moves, I don't think it's the worst move. I just wouldn't want to rely on him to be, you know, you need a front end starter. Yeah, absolutely. Like if that does not, damage your ability to go out and get a frontline starter then okay um i mean he's a guy that you know you know you know what the stuff he has um at one time he was one of the most dominant pitchers in in baseball um you know but he's going to be what 37 38 um, yeah, I, he he's up there. Yes, he he turns thirty seven in April, so he's he's towards the the end of this uh, long storied career. Um, you need you need a frontline pitcher. That's something you need bad. Yes, you have plenty of threes and fours, but you need someone frontline. Yeah, threes and fours don't add up to ones and twos. You know, you don't get enough threes and fours to make a, to make a two. Um, and it's good to have threes and fours, but yeah, yeah. you need those high end guys. Absolutely. You know, nobody, nobody's knocking threes and fours. They just, you just, they're there as a bonus to ones and twos. Right. Um, but I, I want, I wonder who's going to be that first domino to fall in, in the shortstop market. Yeah, that's going to be interesting to see because all those guys are in high demand by a lot of teams. You know, you hear so many teams linked to them. I think the 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 number of teams is going to start to dwindle a little bit because when the the years and the dollars start flushing themselves out, certain teams are going to drop out of that race. And it better not be the Cubs. It better not be the Cubs. Um, unfortunately, I think the Orioles might bow out. I would love to see them. You know, I, I, you know, Cubs. Obviously, I want them to get one, but it would be awesome to see after the Cubs got the, their guy, one of those four go to Baltimore um, to start putting together a winner over there. But the Dodgers will have the money. The Phillies will find the money. Um, the Cubs better have the money. Those, those are the teams that, um, Padres probably somehow will find the money, Boston, some money. Um, I still think Atlanta, if, whether they not, they bring back Dansby Swanson. I think that's a notable destination for a shortstop. I- I don't know what their financial situation looks like. I have not looked enough. The team they I have named, one hell of a GM. I think they'd be willing to spend, but you never know. We'll see. Yeah, I mean the teams I named, definitely they're they're going to pony up. Um, 
we didn't sell enough pumpkins at Gallagher Way. Sorry. Yeah. Jerry Reinsdorf was a real good owner. We're going to take after him. Nobody gets signed for more than $12. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um. So, uh, yeah, the Cubs, such a wild card it is the. Like, it, it's you sort of feel like what it's like to be a Yankees fan in the offseason where your team is linked to everybody that will cost more than a million dollars, you know? Yeah. Uh, do you want to talk basketball or hockey at all? The Bulls stink. The Blackhawks stink. That's all I got. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I, uh, I mean, the, the Blackhawks, the Blackhawks are meant to stink. Yep. Um. Oh, man. Jimmy Garoppolo out for the year. Yep. Foot injury. Whew. Whew. Um. Yeah. I mean. I wish you could get a pers- consistent performance from Patrick Williams and Zach Levine, because Zach Levine tonight had a really good game, but he's had a lot of stinkers and he said a lot of things about his coach in public that just, uh, I, you know, it's a little bit of a shocker to me that we're hearing reports of a contract extension for Billy Donovan. Has he earned it? This is Jerry I- Reinsdorf we're talking about. Yeah, it's but it's AK and and Mark Eversley. Like, but who is above AK and Mark Eversley? Didn't didn't they get like the carte blanche to run the basketball how they wanted to? This is the Reinsdorf family we're talking about. It's frustrating. And I'm not going to shit on Billy Donovan, but there's a reason that he's been fired other places before. Yeah, I I don't think he's the best coach. I don't think he's an awful coach, but I just don't, to me, I I, I see Billy Donovan as like a slightly above average coach, slightly above at best. He's not a great one. He's not a bad one. But I just, I wouldn't give him an extension at this time. But I, I don't know. I don't know how they think out there these days. Your young players. Um, you know, I, you know, you need, you need to, to get the best out of Patrick Williams and you need to get a system in there. That's going to utilize the players you have, because it's a little bit of a hodgepodge who your, your players are like Vooch Vooch is a guy that struggles against good centers and against the Suns, Deandre ate and ate his lunch. Um, you know, he didn't, he didn't have a, uh, um, uh, have a particularly good game today against, uh, against Sabonis um, 12 points, six rebounds. Zach had a great game, but you know, if when Zach is, when Zach has a Zach game, it's kind of like when Jordan before the championships would put in these big games, but they wouldn't win those games. You've got to find a way to, to incorporate those big numbers with, the rest of your team playing well too. And it's, uh, you know, Caruso doesn't look like Caruso. Um, Zach doesn't look like he's a hundred percent at times. And, you know, I would be, I would be shocked if we saw Lonzo ball this year at all. I'm not counting on it. Um, and you get inconsistent performances from your bench, I, I, day in and day out. No idea. No idea what you're going to get. 
No, you really don't. And now we've lost three in a row. You lost to the Kings tonight. You um, almost came back and won your last game, and then it was for not. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So it's a. Uh, it's a. Uh, it's a tough one. And Blackhawks, Mrazic has a uh, another injury. Yay. <laughs> um, so the Blackhawks have recalled Jackson Stauber from Rockford. Um, so whew, have have a pair of a uh, early twenty something goalies uh, at our disposal. <laughs> oh boy, this is going to get worse before it gets better. It's going to get way worse before it gets better. Uh but the good news is they are now the third best odds to get uh to get that number one pick. <laughs> oh my god, if we get Bedard, man. Oh it's I'm not gonna it's so... not gonna change everything, but it makes that trajectory much faster. Oh, I mean it it just it rockets what you're trying to do. When you because, have a generational talent like that. Yeah, because he will come in day one. He's not going to go to Rockford. He's not going to go anywhere else. He's going to play for the Blackhawks mm-hmm. right off the bat. Um, You know, and we're, we're good. What? Three months from the, the trade deadline. Yeah, we still have a little ways to go. I think I'm saying there's probably a 75 plus chance right now. Patrick Kane waves that no movement clause. Yeah, I, I think it's, I think the chances are solid at least. I don't think he's having fun. No, I, I, I wouldn't be. Boy, when he, when he goes, Wow. Those, I mean, he's not putting up crazy numbers, but just the fact that your most competent scorer goes, man, is going to be just tank city. Yep. Yep. Hey. When Mackenzie Entwistle is, is, is one of your best players, you're like, Woo! <laughs> you know what? I'm going to be going to games later in the season and nobody is ever going to question my loyalty to this team. Oh, I, yeah, absolutely. And I'll still go too. It's just, it's just going to be a, I'm going to go at a loss. <laughs> oh, but it's going to be so much cheaper. Going to get nice cheap tickets. So and... much cheaper. And if on giveaway nights, you don't have to get there early to get them. You could probably yes. walk back and ask them for two. <laughs> Can I get another one? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. No one else is coming in here. <laughs> uh, you'll yeah, be going be like, uh, is it clown shoes day? Yes. Every day is clown shoes day for this season. <laughs> All the, cl- they, the clown shoes that they're giving away are just these like giant, massive clown shoes that you had to hold each one with like two hands. You got to like put them in your arms to secure them. Uh, people are trying to walk up the stairs to the second and third <laughs> floors with those shoes and tripping. <laughs> the escalator keeps jamming because the clown <laughs> shoes keep getting caught. in them. <laughs> Uh, uh, ding dong George comes out and he's like hey I got a pair of those shoes at my office (laughs) I need a new pair that's why I came tonight mine say bears on them what do yours say (laughs) Blackhawks oh that's nice Uh, they both start with the letter B (laughs) I like it Uh, maybe I'll give it a ride to the airport (laughs) our GM GM got picked up by the owner (laughs) at the airport 
throw him back in his Toyota Tercel. Yeah, that's that's George. <laughs> Pers- personal with his employees. Uh, God, if I was at the airport and saw Ding Dong George, I, I don't know what I would have done. Oh, I, man. I, I would have told him my impersonation of him. Hey, how you doing? Uh, got him to autograph my letter. Hey, can you sign this? You wrote this to me. You already put your signature on it, but can you sign it again? <laughs> <laughs> this time in blue. Is purple okay? I got my purple crayon. <laughs> uh, George and his purple crayon. Ding dong, George and the purple crayon. You know, recently I was actually going back to that podcast. I believe we first brought up Ding Dong George after the Packers lost in Green Bay last year. And um, that's when you first said Ding Dong George, and I just about lost it. <laughs> oh, Ding Dong George. It's, it's been an even better, you know, mascot to the show than, uh, than Buttercup. Yeah, and Buttercup had a nice run, but Ding Dong George is is uh, mascot number one. Yeah, oh, Ding Dong George. Yep. Oh, you know what? You know what else too is the Blackhawks are down three nothing middle of the third period, so we are about to get the holy trinity of Chicago losses: Bears loss, Bulls loss, Blackhawks loss. Ah. Uh. Yeah. Not a fun day in, in Chicago. Unfortunately, this has become pretty typical. Let's end on this note. Okay. Who, which of the Chicago teams, the Bulls, the Blackhawks, the Bears, the Cubs, and the White Sox, we're not going to include the Red Stars or the Fire or anybody, the, the four major sports. Who will be the next Chicago sports team to win a championship? Mm. I'm going to say not the Bulls. I think we can eliminate that. They're just stuck in basketball hell right now. They're so far from doing that. The Blackhawks are going to take a long time to rebuild. And there's no guarantees. The White Sox, I think that window is closed. I think they're closer to a rebuild than a championship. Yeah, I mean, I still think they have a chance. I just don't think it's as open as it was because I still do think that this team alone, if they if their key guys stay healthy and rebound, I, I do think they will be in the playoffs. I just don't know if they're good enough to win in the postseason. It's kind of in to me. I think they still technically have a better chance. The Cubs, we got to see what they 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 do here this offseason. I mean, I'm I can't believe I'm saying this. I'm tempted to say the Bears because they have the most important position in all of sports locked down. Honestly, that's you know, if I had to rank them, I would probably say Bears then Cubs because the Cubs are coming out of their rebuild and into the spend money to win phase. Um, Hopefully, it's successful, but yeah. And the Bears are are hopefully on the last four four or five weeks of the the tanking section and then upward from there. Uh so um I I would be I would be shocked if they're not, you know trying to be competitive next year. So those are the two, I think most likely they're the, the next two to compete. So I, I'm going to say bears. Then yeah. And, and, and I say bears, like you just said, bears. What a sad state of affairs. We thank Dick uh, and God for all they have provided. Oh, Cubs win! Cubs win! Cubs win! Oh, I don't want her. You can have her. She's a Packer fan. 
she can't fit in my van. And she looks like number New Yorkers. Smoking crack is not legal on planes. Bears, 31, the negative 7. The Bears. Oh, when the Bears go bearing down.